Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Reed. I'm with the Mark cast. Uh, we cover, you know, spring league and XFL and all sorts of other alternative football. Uh, I will say when um, coach mummy, when I announced that you were coming on today, uh, tremendous support and, and interest and, and questions from our listeners. I really appreciate you taking the time. It does mean a lot to the people to listen to our show. Well, sure. I'm happy to do it. Uh, what has life been like for you the last couple weeks? I know we're a little removed from the big mega bowl championship game. What has life been like for you? Well, I'm, I'm working on, uh, I'm tutoring some guys here in the Dallas area and, uh, some quarterbacks and receivers. So I, I've been kind of kicking back and taking it easy after living in a hotel suite in Indianapolis for eight weeks. It's been uh, fun to be back home and cook our own meals and stuff. Uh, but we have been doing a little tutoring, and then uh, next week I'm going to the beach for a little vacation. Uh, a well well deserved vacation after a championship run. What was what was your experience like uh, in Indianapolis? First off, how did that come about? You getting asked to be involved in the league? Well, Brian Woods is the CEO of that league, and he called me on uh, about April of around the middle of April, April fifteenth, I believe, and uh, asked me if I'd do it. He had offered it to June Jones, but June was in Honolulu and didn't want to spend two months in Indianapolis. So he, uh, he recommended me. And so then Brian called me and told me all about it. And I said, sure, we'll come do that. Uh, is that something that, um, you know, as a coach and someone that works with players, I mean, does that get you really excited to go into a league like that and, and get to, you know, maybe scout some new talent and work with some younger talent? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, and we, we did see a lot of uh, talent and uh, a lot of people maybe for the future. And uh, the, the, the neat thing about those players was they were all kind of guys that got caught in the 2019, uh, played their senior season, and then the virus hit, and they didn't have a chance to have a pro day or any tryouts or anything like that. And then the NFL cut back their rosters. And so free agents were, you know, you pretty much had to already be in the league in order to get signed. So all these guys were guys that, deserved a chance but really didn't get one that year and so then this gave him some you know it gave him six six or seven real good films uh talk about the quality of the talent that, that was in that league that you got to work with i mean specifically on the linemen but obviously you got to see some of the other teams as well talk about the level of a player that was involved in the spring league well i you know i talked to jerry glanville when i got in that league and he he had done it he had been doing it he had a team called the conquerors and he said, you know, it's the most fun you'll ever have. He said, these guys hit harder than anybody you've ever been around. And he was pretty much right. I mean, they're, they're all out there playing for a chance. And I, I know Jerry's already signed six guys just to the Chargers alone. Uh, we've signed three to Canada, and uh, we're hoping to get some more here soon. But I, I think the level of play was, was really good, probably on par with, with uh, 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 you know, the, the XFL or Canadian football, that sort of thing. And then and then there's occasionally guys that are going to get signed by the NFL. Um, so we had Stan Bellois on our show as well um, earlier on in the season. Uh, what was the process like for, for bringing him in as one of the QB coaches? And uh, and tell me about that because Stan is, is a tremendous fellow as well. Well, he is. And he's, I've worked with him before. He's really knowledgeable. He's really bright. Uh, he is the all-time leading passer in Europe. <laughs> and probably spent about three decades over there playing quarterback. Uh, so I, when, when Brian gave me the, the team, he said, I'm giving you a pool of players, but you don't have to keep any of them. Well, of course, the, of course, the first guy I looked at was the quarterback and it was Ryan Willis. And, and I could tell he had, he had played at Kansas, which means he had, they had been running air raid there when he was there. So he, he knew about it. And then he did a, a great job at, at Virginia Tech, but he unfortunately got hurt his senior year. And, and then the virus hit. So he's the perfect example of what I was talking about a while ago. So I thought, well, who do I need to get to be the backup quarterback? And then it dawned on me that, well, if I bring Stan in as the backup quarterback, he'll end up rooming with Brian and he'll coach him up all day long. So that's what we did. And I think there was a lot of skepticism at first about bringing a 36-year-old guy who's 5'9 to be the backup quarterback. But Stan got – he got a – we got way ahead of one team, and, and he got about a, a quarter of play or so and, and did a real nice job through a touchdown pass. So we uh, he, he made us look good. But the main thing he did was he uh, he held for extra points, and he he 
was constantly talking to to Ryan Willis, and and I think that accelerated the learning curve for Ryan in in, in our offense. Uh, yeah, so one of our listeners from the Fourth and Long podcast, they had asked that too. Did you just decide to go with Willis the whole time? I mean, was that a conscious choice to not have another? You know, because in the spring league, a lot of the teams would have two QBs that they would kind of swap out. Um, you yeah, know, half and half. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to just have one guy. So I knew Ryan. Uh, Ryan would respond well to Stan, and I knew Stan would be on board. With, you know, just being the backup and and basically being a player coach. Do you think that that I, I know that there were some uh, questions in the championship game about uh, with Luis Perez and the jousters and maybe he should have been put back in or whatever. Do you think it was easier with you having that one quarterback in Ryan the whole time that you really got to get in that sink the whole season? I mean, and then the championship game as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always, you know, it's always difficult to split reps and and it, at any level and at the professional level, it's it's really difficult and and. uh because you just don't have that many practice reps during the week, and and uh, I, I think going with with Ryan full time really helped us. It helped us develop a lot of chemistry with our receivers. Uh, uh, going into that uh, the championship game, um, uh, you know, obviously a win came down to the wire. What was what was it like being, um, you know, winning that big mega bowl? You know, does that is it more for the players at that point? Do you, you know, what is it like to be the championship winning team of of the spring league twenty twenty one? Well, we had a we had a unique team. I think it, those guys really bonded, and and you know, we were all living in the same hotel there together for for eight weeks, and and. Uh, they saw each other all the time. There, there's a lot of room for people to hate each other, you know, but, but our guys responded. They were, they liked each other. They hung around with each other. They, they partied after games with each other. Uh, I just think they bonded pretty well. And, and so it was a really pleasant experience for us. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that's always true in that situation, but, but our guys were a unique group. And, and so when, and it was, uh, you know, the, I, I can truly say that, that that championship game, there was just one focus, and that was just to get the trophy. And and uh, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of selfish people on that team. In fact, there wasn't any that I know of. Uh, as someone, you know, and obviously uh, Brian Woods is is in the news as well with kind of all this USFL stuff. You know, he brought you in. Uh, you know, what's the relationship like there? What are your thoughts with Brian now as he kind of continues on on this next path? Oh, well, I'm, I think it's a brilliant move for him to do what he's doing, and I certainly would like to be part of it. And uh, we've got a good relationship. Uh, did that news come as a shock to you during the season with all the, 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 the news of the USFL relaunch? He told us when we got there that there were some exciting things coming down the pipe that would be announced, but he didn't tell us what. And Brian's, Brian's a good poker player. He keeps his cards really close to the vest. And so we, we're all kind of sitting there going, well, I wonder what he's talking about, you know? And, uh, and then when he made the announcement about the USFL, I thought that was just brilliant to bring back those logos and those team names. And uh, the, the USFL probably of all these leagues had the best run and the best, kind of the best nostalgic feeling about it. Do you think that there's enough uh, goodwill and nostalgia there to, to help? Um, you know, it, it's a crowded landscape now. Obviously, XFL is pushed now to 2023. D- does that seem more intriguing of a place to wind up as a player or as a coach than, than to wait around for whatever Danny and company is going to do with XFL? Oh, yeah. I want to I want to do the USFL. Have you heard at all from, from Danny and the Rock or any of those people? Uh, no. Uh, so we had a lot of questions from our, from our listeners and and some of these are a little funnier and some of these are a little more serious. So hopefully we can, we can bounce around with these, uh, Kenny Stevenson, longtime friend of the show. And this is something that we've talked about a lot. Um, you know, cause obviously us in podcasts, we watch the games, watch you all the way back in the XFL. We watch the spring league, watch all these things. Uh, what is the story behind the towel that you wear during the games? Kenny says, (laughs) Kenny says, why towels? That's always the first question I get. Well, I'll tell you, I always had a towel around uh, because I have really bad sinuses and I sweat a lot. And and so I would keep one around. Well, when I got the job at the University of Kentucky, they noticed that. Obviously, the SEC is a fishbowl. Everything you do gets scrutinized. And so they came to me after the first season there and said, we'd like to have Hal towels. And so Nike wanted to do that. So uh, I said, okay, I'll do it as long as we can give the money to charity. 
Well, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to keep the money. So a local hospital there, my my ex wife June had breast cancer and and she was going through treatment. And so I worked with one of the hospitals there in town, and they they did it and they created these howl towels and they they paid this this young lady to stand on the sidelines. And all she did was every time I put the towel down, she put it back on my shoulder. <laughs> So after a while, I mean, it didn't take very long. The SEC just got all these pictures and video of me wearing a towel around my neck. So when I when I left there after four years, and I sat out a year because of the NCAA stuff, mm-hmm. and and uh, then I got the job restarting the program at Southeast Louisiana. And I thought, well, the one good thing is maybe I can get rid of this whole towel program <laughs> and go back to doing what I used to do. So we had the press conference to announce me as the head coach at Southeast Louisiana. I walk in the room, there's like 400 people all waving towels, <laughs> yellow towels at me. So I thought, well, I may as well just buy into it. So I just owned it. Uh, this kid, uh, Jake Henry wants to, he asked, how's the leg? We all watched your uh, traumatic incident last, uh, uh, a little, I mean, in the springtime last year. How, how's the leg uh, healing up? Oh, it, it, it healed up pretty nicely. It was, uh, the hardest part was I broke the bursa sac, which caused all the swelling. And and that was really, really pretty bad for about a month. And then uh, the the fracture was actually just a hairline of the top of the tibia, so it, it healed up on its own pretty nicely. Uh, uh, listener Seth said, "Run or pass." <laughs> well, a pass, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, Kevin, longtime friend, he says, uh, "Should the Chargers be like you and run their offense through Donald Parham?" Um, well, if I had Donald Parham, I'm not going to try and second guess the Chargers. I couldn't even tell you who's coaching them, but but uh, I do think uh, Parham is a weapon. And the great thing about Donald is Donald knows where the end zone is, and he is he is a guy who can score. I mean, you know, you see a lot of big guys like him, but sometimes you get them down to, in the red zone, and they just they just aren't as effective as you would expect them to be. But Donald's not like that. I mean, he gets in the red zone, his eyes light. Uh, uh, Alden wants to know, um, I guess, I- any players that you've worked with, you maybe, you know, in, in this recent iteration of the Spring League, you know, if the USFL, whatever the next uh, Spring League that launches, potentially that you're involved in, any players that you, you know, maybe Ryan Willis, any other players that you would be interested in seeing hop over, people that you've worked with in the Spring League? Oh, well, I... I- told that whole team that if we if I got a job they were going to get a shot so <laughs> I'd, I'd like to work with all of them they all, they all did a great job they all had different roles uh, some of them more talented than others but but the thing they did so well is they played as a team and uh, but there are some standout guys you just mentioned Willis he's one for sure I think Isaac Zico our, our wide receiver and Ben Putnam our slot receiver uh, or, or two that come to mind Um there, there are both of our running backs were very effective. And when they, you know, when they walk through the door, you know, you know, most NFL guys aren't going to like them. They look like the team manager or something, you know. But they, they both, they're both quick. Uh, they've got burst. They're courageous. They'll block in every situation, and and they really have uh, a knack for. Uh, finding the running lanes, whether it's catching a ball or, or running the lead draw or, or running the counter play. Uh, I, I was excited, uh, specifically a uh, friend of the show, Cole Boozer, that was one of the linemen on the linemen. You know, he got sent yeah. to the Alouettes, you know, during the season. What, you know, was that, uh, I guess, exciting to know that uh, there were obviously eyeballs on what you all were doing, that even in the midst of the season that they were signing players in talent up north? Yeah, I think so, and and uh, I was happy for Cole. He got a good contract, and and uh, we wished him well, and gave him the game ball after our last game with him. That's nice. Uh, and then uh, fourth and long had one other. Uh, you know, you were involved in the XFL. You know, for for you know the five five weeks, the TSL. You know, uh, for the you know six weeks. Uh, what would be the the quali- similar quality of players between the leagues? Similar quality of talent. How would you you know similar time frame in both of those leagues? Um, yeah, what, yeah, you know, the XFL got cut off. It should have been twice as long as it was. Um, the, the, uh, the spring league, I think for what it was trying to accomplish, it was just about right. I mean, the, the, the basic idea was that the, the players get filmed 
And and so six games is plenty for that. And they it, it gave us a chance to play everybody, give everybody a chance to shine. And then getting to one more game in the championship game and being featured on Fox, I think, helped some of them. Uh, you know, I know we had a DB sign right after the championship game. So, I, you know, I think that's about the right deal. I, I think in a in a they bring back a real uh, a spring league where you have real franchises in real cities and real hopefully real people sitting in the stands instead of fake crowd noise it, it'll be a little different situation but it i think the quality play will be like the spring league or better was that weird playing uh w- with no fans kind of in that isolated uh st- i mean huge stadium too yeah, you get used to it after a while. And I've coached a lot of small college football, so we're used to playing in front of nobody. Uh, I always remember, I think they asked Bill Belichick, uh, the, you know, the first game, whatever, last year with the Patriots. He's like, it's like practice. It's, it's, it's the same. You know, there's not that much difference in, in, in playing, you know, a practice versus playing. Um, uh, last questions, uh, you know, just moving on. I mean, obviously excited for whatever comes with Brian Woods and company in the future. Any other plans you have going forward here in the next uh, next six, nine months? Uh, no, not really. We're doing some clinics and stuff like that. Uh, our air raid certified deal and work on that a little bit every day. And, and so, you know, we can, uh, we're just going to continue that and see what the next adventure is going to be. Uh, well, I think, you know, I think, uh, hopefully in, in high demand here, you know, as, as the, the winning coach of the spring league and obviously putting together a good team and, um, you know, a lot of visibility, you know, they had a good viewership, you know, throughout the season that, you know, roughly 400,000 people at each game on Fox. Yeah. I mean, uh, you feel like, uh, overall, uh, your, your time in the spring league was a success. Yeah, I think it was a success for the whole league, not just me. Um, and, and our players, I, I think everybody put on a good show, even the teams that didn't win as much. They they still, all the games were close games. And uh, there was very few blowouts. Uh, most of them were, you know, like all our, our last four in a row were all come from two scores down in the fourth quarter. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun to watch and look forward to doing it again. Perfect. Uh, well, uh, again, Coach Mummy, thank you so much for your time. I know that people will be excited to hear from you, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking a few minutes out of uh, your morning to do this. Appreciate it, Reed. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. What's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, my man? Sorry for being late. No worries. I appreciate it. This is uh, – exciting uh first off just because uh obviously who you are and everything what we've been trying to get the spring league coverage back on we had brian woods on a couple weeks ago and so you're the first person we've had the opportunity to talk with now you know in the bubble everything playing uh so how uh first off how has everything been going so far good man it's a great you know great experience um definitely unique coming from my end i I seem to be the guy everybody wants to interview. I guess I'm like the token old guy or something, but, uh, but no, it's, it's been awesome. Just, um, you know, getting to go out and practice and play with these young guys that are extremely talented and, um, and, you know, just in awe of the level of coaching and, you know, the names here that you see. So it's just to be a part of that is an incredible experience. Something that, that I never would have expected happening. Well, and it's something that we've definitely expected our listeners and fans uh, for the spring league, right? You know, good football, the games have come back. It's Mm -hmm. been exciting. It's been athletic. Uh, What have you seen so far, you know, both interacting with everybody on the sidelines and the games, uh, what have you uh, seen with the level of play so far? I mean, I think it's good. I I think something that kind of surprised me just from, I guess, not knowing too much about the spring league, is all of the transactions that you're seeing, you know, guys being signed, released, and, you know, picked up by other teams, things like that. So it's been it's been pretty interesting to see that professional side of things that, you know, if a guy comes in, he doesn't perform, or he gets a bit banged up when you're playing such a short season, you really got a lot of make – you got to make a lot of moves and make them fast. So, I mean, you know, obviously – you know, seeing the talent of some of the guys here. I, one thing that's blown me away is a specialist. There's some really good kickers, punters in this league. You know, those guys are pinning it down on the one. You got the 59-yard field goal from the guy in Houston. Um, our, our, our little guy, Jonathan, almost got the 56-yarder the other night. Thought our running backs, if they could have just ran for one more yard the play before, we yeah. probably would have scored. Um, but 
No, I mean, it's a great level to play. The offensive line plays very good. I think trenches both sides is really good. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely see a mix of guys that have played at that level and, you know, small school guys that are just trying to get the shot. And then you got, you know, the mix of the guys that were in the camps that, you know, were, or were drafted to the league here. And then you got the guys that are um, – putting forth the money, you know, for that opportunity to play. So it's a, it's a really wide range of guys. And uh, I think a wide range of, I guess, goals for people. I think some are happy just getting to play on television. Some are trying to get out of here as soon as possible. Uh, it, it, it never uh, ceases to amaze me, you know, the people we meet and, and interact with, you know, here I am sitting watching the game on Saturday, I got a beer, and I hear Kevin and Brock telling this wonderful story about you, you know, your background, time in Europe, everything else. And I think, what an incredible story and an individual, right? I have to reach out to this, you know, guy to get him on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And I go, we already follow each other online. This is wonderful, right? <laughs> and, and what I love about it is, uh, and, and I wish Paul could have been here today, my co-host. He had to work. We couldn't get media stuff, you know, figured out. But you exemplify like everything that you know our podcast, what we try to do, what our listeners right, getting players the opportunities, players that that are, are fighting for the opportunity right, that that maybe you know missed their chance or were never given a chance. Someone looked the other way. Uh, so I mean, not that we have to rehash the whole FS1 thing, but could you give us maybe the the Cliff Notes elevator pitch? of kind of your, your background and that they talked about on the broadcast. Yeah. Well, one thing I was upset is that, you know, he said I had, um, 343 touchdowns and it was, I have, a, I have 438. Yeah. So he kind of jipped me of 95. So I was a little bit upset about that. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, I, I guess to make it kind of quick, I, I'm from a town of about a thousand in Southwest Arkansas, right near the Texas border. And, um, you know, growing up, baseball was my sport. That was probably, and I had, even in high school, I had division one offers for baseball and I mean, we were small wing, wing T team, uh, you know, played a lot, but was never a starter. Uh, I don't think I started a game after seventh grade in football, but again, it wasn't football is something I did for fun. Uh, baseball is what I was doing, you know, all summers. And that was my focus. And, um, yeah, so, you know, got through that, never had any remote thought process of, oh, one day I want to try to play, you know, college football or anything like that. That was just something that I kind of did on the side. I was enamored by the, I guess, the X's and O's aspect of it, the mental aspect. And always it was a plan that, well, I'm going to go play Major League Baseball and then I'm going to coach in the NFL after, you know, that that's what, you know, nine-year-old Stan would have told you. So, um, yeah, went, uh, decided to go to a division two close to home to play baseball. That was a really successful program. Um, and was there for a year. I took my rotator cuff and then transferred to a junior college, played baseball there for two years in Northern Arkansas. And, you know, after having all of these division one offers out of high school, and then in co- after two years of JUCO, not having any Division One offers, you know, D2 small schools, I was just like, oh, well, maybe it's time to try to focus on football because that's if, – if, you know, if I can't make it out of here, I'm not going to make it much farther than this. I, I like to think I'm a pretty realistic guy about, you know, opportunities and my chances on things. So I thought, okay, well, it'd be good if I could be a part of a football team in college to see what that's like. And it would be really good if I could find a way to get on the field. And so, you know, I'd read this article about this team in North Dakota that got beat 105 to zero by a pretty bad team. And I just thought like, well, you know, I should be able to play there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, put together, scrubs up what I could from highlights and, uh, you know, sent it out. I had a few NA offers and things like that, but it was always like the interesting thing to me because, uh, the head coach there, Jim Dodson had told me like, yeah, you come here. He's like, you'll, you'll be my guy. And I mean, they had about 30 guys on the team and, you know, a lot of guys going both ways and went there and we were running, running the veer and I'm not a very fast guy. And so 
you know, one of those linebackers caught me and uh, my first game, I popped my AC joint and I was just like, man, I came all the way up here to North Dakota living in a town of, you know, under a thousand at a Bible college and I'm not very religious. I'm like, this is going to be a long fall. And so I, I just played it with the coaches. I'm like, you know, I played defense a lot in high school. Let me, let, let's see what I can do there. And, you know, they moved me, they, they let me play safety. And then midway through that second game, I ended up starting at safety the next week. And we, we were that hurt for numbers, I guess. But uh, midway through, we had a receiver go down, and I knew the offense because I played, you know, quarterback. So I jumped in there and had a few catches. And the rest of the year, I started both ways. I have to be the least – the most unathletic two-way starter in the history of college football. <laughs> and, um, yeah, did that. And our head coach there had spent a little time in Europe doing clinics and – one night he brought up football in Europe and I thought, okay, I'd like to do that. So found a website, europlayers.com, you know, put, put all my stuff in there and had a chance for Switzerland, take a chance on me or a team from Switzerland took a chance on me. And from there it was, you know, not a very good year. Second year in Finland, I did pretty good. And third year I started running the air raid. I mean, when I started doing that, it was just, you know, it took off. It went from, 150 yards passing in a game being like, wow, I threw for triple digits to, you know, I think the first area game I threw for 469 and seven touchdowns. And I was like, Oh, this is pretty easy. (laughs) So, yeah. So from there, I mean, it's just been all, you know, throughout Europe every year coming back, uh, coaching, coaching college football. Uh, I've been an offensive coordinator at junior colleges for five years. Um, I coached with Coach Mummy at Bell Haven University in Mississippi in 2015. I was just recently the – I just left actually to come here. I was offensive coordinator at Manchester University, which is just two hours up the road here in Indiana. And um, yeah, so it's been a lot of college ball, uh, small college football, uh, globe trotting all over playing and kind of being the Jackie Moon of yeah. European football. I think nine years I've been – head coach, offensive coordinator, and quarterback at the same time. And in 2016, I was the head coach of a team in Rome and the head coach quarterback OC of a team in Finland whose season's actually interlapped by a a month. So I was literally, if we had a bye week in Italy, I would fly to Finland and do a training camp for that week, and then I'd fly back to Italy. And, you know, that was – I'm I'm probably the only person that's ever been the head coach of two teams at the same time that were playing at the same time in two different countries. So, so so how did this, did they, how did it come to you come to the spring league now? Is it with, with, because of coach mummy or did they reach out? How did that go to get you here now? uh, They they needed a mascot. So (laughs) they thought I'd look good on TV. Yeah. Right. Um, Now now, coach mummy. I mean, we've been, you know, since he saw me speak at the AFCA convention in 2015, and um, you know, since then we we've, we've had a good relationship. We hung out that night, and he offered me a job that night at Bellhaven. And you know, since then we've always been in touch. And um, he brought me to Dallas to work the training camp with the Renegades last year because I had a little. I was back home in the, in the South for Christmas, so I went there for one of the weeks. I was home, and we'd actually been talking about going to Europe together. And that was kind of, that's something we worked, we were working on in the spring was trying to find somewhere that we could go. The hippie head coach, I played quarterback. We thought like, how cool would it be, you know, for me to look over on the sideline and see you call a mesh, which we know you're going to call every play anyway. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we had talked about that. We talked to some teams in Europe and that never really worked out. And, and it just, it was, the sun Sunday so a week before everyone was reporting on that Sunday, I think it was the night after or the afternoon after uh, he was announced as the head coach for the lineman. He just sent me a simple lowercase text out of the blue. Haven't talked to him in two months. He just said, come be backup QB and QB coach. <laughs> and I responded, um, I was like, I'd happily come be your QB coach, but I don't know if I'm in shape to, you know, to play quarterback at that level now. You know, I kind of thought it was done. And um, then he, his response was, I'm going to call you. <laughs> and then he basically called me and told me, how much shape do you need to be in to catch and throw a football? And he's like, plus, you know, Ryan's going to play every snap anyway, unless he gets hurt or something. So, 
you know, and yeah, and I thought about it. I was like, well, this is a good opportunity. And, you know, while all the players are, you know, trying to impress someone and maybe get, you know, signed to an NFL roster for me, it's like, yeah, well, I'm not going to be a, you know, a five, nine, five, 10, 30, six year old rookie quarterback. It's just not going to happen in the NFL, but there's plenty of probably five, 10, 36 year old coaches in the NFL. So I was like, well, maybe I get there and I make, you know, good connections and get a chance to do that. So even though I never played, um, you know, pro major league baseball, maybe I can do the second part and coach in the NFL. And what has been the reaction? I mean, obviously having someone with such a wealth of knowledge on the field, you know, playing everywhere now coming in and being able to help these players, you know, be alongside coach mummy. I mean, what has that been like in the reaction from your teammates? I think at first it was, well, I, I remember the first practice that we had, uh, we, we, we went to do, um, we were doing a inside run and, you know, receiver DBs were doing one-on-ones. So Ryan was over there throwing the one-on-ones and I went to handle the inside run. And, you know, I was, we were trying to get a certain look in the run game. So, you know, I'm there dressed up as quarterback and, you know, I got the shoulder pads coming on and I'm like telling these linebackers, Hey, you move this way, you do this, you do this. And, you know, our, our, uh, defensive line coach Chuck Bolo was like, so those guys were like, you know, who the hell is this old bald guy telling us what to do? <laughs> and, you know, they're like, no, no, he's a coach too. So, you know, I, I think it was a bit strange at first of, you know, who am I and what I'm doing? When I was walking through the halls here, it was never a what team are you playing for? It's like, who do you coach? And things like that. But, you know, as it, it just went along and, you know, we practiced, I, you know, now it's just, it's, it's really a unique thing because, you know, I game plan with Coach Mommy. I call plays with Coach Mommy. Um, go out with the coaches um, to dinner. I'll go, you know, hang out with the players. And so it's kind of a unique situation where I'm seen as a player and as a coach from like all ends. And I mean, it, 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 it works really well, I think. It's all the other players call me a coach and sir, <laughs> which I, I don't know if I'd prefer that or not, yeah. but you know, it, it works. And I mean, ultimately, you know, what I've told these guys is I know I'm not, I'm not going to go to the next level from here. You know, this would be the pinnacle of my career from a playing standpoint, but you know, I'm going to do everything that I can to help you guys reach your goals. And I think that, you know, when people know that you don't have that, your motives are strictly to help them reach their goals and guys are going to, you know, take to you a lot better. I, want, I, I, want, I really enjoy it. Yeah. I want to make sure I get this in before we get cut off. Uh, we, you know, we cover a lot of these alt leagues, right? We've covered fan control mm-hmm. football, spring league. Um, and the reason why we do it is for the players, right. To, you know, to give them the platform, to get the name out, you know, if we can cover these leagues, talk about the importance of having something like the spring league, as a place for players, you know, to come, like I said before, you know, if, if they've missed their chance or it didn't work out timing wise to have something like this, where they can play on national television, obviously, you know, under the expertise of people like you coach mummy, you know, all the other, you know, Jerry Glanville, I mean, all the other, you know, tremendous mm-hmm. amount when they announced the coaches were like, this is crazy. The amount of talent they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. So how important is it to have a league and a place like this for players like you and others? I mean, I think it's incredible. It's, um, you know, you got guys that <laughs> there's so many guys that were just sit that maybe were in an NFL camp a year ago that are sitting at home now, or you know, take Ryan Willis, our our young quarterback. He's you know he's been at Exos out in Arizona, you know, throwing to NFL receivers all the time, and he, he's just out there working out every day, waiting for an opportunity, waiting for a call, and. I mean, I doubt there's just a lot of, honestly, NFL scouts that are coming and watching a guy just stand around and throw to receivers. So, I mean, for a chance, you know, for guys to have that platform to go out and play at a high level on games that are on, you know, television, where it's easy to see, I think it's, I mean, it's incredible. You know, there's, the NBA has something similar. The, you know, baseball has however many levels of minor league baseball you know for football it's not you could say okay well you know indoor baller but there's no 
anybody that's really scouting hard indoor football to see who's going to translate to the 11 man game. So, I mean, you know, leagues like this are, it's essential. And just from the amount of guys already that, you know, since we've started the season in these two weeks, I think there's probably been about five or six guys that have, you know, that are signed contracts. Just saw another, another quarterback in the South. Um, it was today, yesterday or today. I picked up and that's, these guys that probably wouldn't have got picked up had they not been here. And that's whether they played on the field or not. You know, the fact that they're here and when you got four or five NFL coaches on your staff, that carries some weight. And when they, you know, if a Terry Shea says, hey, this guy can play quarterback in the NFL, he can probably play quarterback in the NFL. I mean, it's, 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 it's great. It's, I can't say anything bad about it. As someone that has had to go through so much, you know, self perseverance, you know, fighting against the odds, making your own way, what would be your advice for other players, ones that you are are playing alongside now, you know, people that are watching this, as someone that's really, you know, to self motivate and go through all that and really find your way? I'd say to focus on where you are right now. I I, I think that there's always so much push of well, if I you know, if I do well here, then maybe, you know, if I'm in college, if I do well here, then the scouts will see me and I'll play. And the, but, you know, the, the thought process is where I'm going instead of where I'm at now. And, you know, I mean, I've never thought from a standpoint of, you know, from best seasons I've had in Europe, I've never thought like, okay, I might get that call and get that workout with the Jets or whoever. You know, there's never been that thought process. And being that realistic that, you know, I'm, there's not going to be people looking to sign me now. It's been a thing where I can focus on doing exactly what I need to do to execute and to help my team and, you know, to work on my craft. And, you know, I think if you're, if you're talented enough and you're working hard and you're focusing on every rep and practice and getting better and doing that rep the best that you possibly can, and you're putting in the time, the film work, and in the gym and doing everything else that you need to do, it's natural. It's going to take care of itself. And I, I think instead of just, you know, focus on, on where I can go, it's just being the best you that you can be wherever you're at right now. That's great. You've been so gracious with your time. I don't want to hold up today. I know we got, uh, you know, uh, media availability and everything, but I really appreciate, you know, making the time. We love to get uh, players like you and others that are in these leagues, you know, on the show, talking about things, talking about the importance of it, because it's one thing for Paul and I to spout about it. And it's another thing to hear, you know, the real life people that are doing everything and, and coming mm-hmm. on and, and speaking the, you know, how they feel about it. So I, I want to thank you so much. We'll have to get you on another time when we're not in all this league stuff. Cause I feel like your story could, we could fill a podcast just with your life story about everything that you've seen and done and all the accomplishments that you have. Yeah. I, th- I think more so than hearing my story would just be hearing stories in general. I like that. I, I, I think that's something we're doing sometimes. Well, we'll, we'll schedule it. We'll get you, <laughs> we'll get you through. We'll get the alignment, the championship, and then we'll get you on as a, as a, one of the, the winning coaches. And we'll, We'll, we'll do this again. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it.